Today I'm going to be speaking from Isaiah chapter 60, verse 2, one, you know, the passage that was read. Uh, it's a popular verse, uh, passage for those of us who have been believers for a while. I'm sure as you read it, you're like, yeah, 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 we've had that before. That's a, you know. Uh, so, but I believe the Lord gave me that uh, just for this month, and I actually spoke about that on, on Monday when we met for the prayer, for the Holy Communion prayer, and I just felt... The Lord really want me to speak it, on, uh, you know, on, in, the, in the church on Sunday, uh, because I really felt it's a message that many of us here really need to hear. Isaiah 60 is considered a messianic prophecy. Isaiah is probably the most prominent messianic prophet in the Bible. Uh, that is the one quoted the most in the New Testament. Usually when you talk about Jesus, if you read Matthew, I think one of the things you will see that so that what was written shall be fulfilled. That's probably the most common phrase in the first three, four chapters. You know, so that it might be fulfilled that was written by the prophet. Most of those prophecies were really by Isaiah. He was a larger than life prophet, you know, for the, uh, in the Jewish uh, history, he was the most prominent prophet spoke about the life of Jesus, his birth, you know, and to us a child is born, all those prophecies, prophecies about, you know, uh, his, his birth, his death, his resurrection, uh, about the church, uh, all those came from Isaiah. So Isaiah is very, very, very prominent prophet. So in Isaiah 60, even though a lot of his prophecies were also relevant to the time, you're going to see that uh, in fact, in theology, that is called sensus prelum, which is simply uh, double meaning. Simply means a lot of those prophecies were being spoken as if, I mean, they were relevant at the time, but they had a fuller meaning that only people who had revel. In fact, many of us, many of them, maybe only later, people realized that, wow, this was actually speaking about the future. So this was him speaking to Zion that was in ruins, that was battered, destroyed, and was telling them, you know, that you're going to shine at some point, that God's glory is still coming. But in real sense of it, he's really talking to the church. He's talking to us. That is the fuller meaning of the prophecy. He's talking that the church must arise, or we must arise, you know, for the glory of God, because the glory of God has come. So, But I'm going to talk about the word glory first. So I'm going to talk to another very, very, very popular passage, which is Romans 3.23, to talk about the concept of glory uh, from God's standpoint, because sometimes we use this word glory, you know, God's glory. I mean, we almost don't really know what it means, and sometimes we even mystify them so much that they lose their meaning. Uh, you know, uh, we think really a cloud has to physically appear, you know, and, and these things. So we lose the sense of what the Bible is trying to communicate. So in Romans 3.23, uh, which we, I think we've all read it before, or at least we've had an evangelist talk about this. I mean, read this before, right? It says, all have seen and fall short of the glory of God. So he's saying, all have sinned. So talking about the human race, all of us came on the scene and fall short of the glory. Most times when we talk about this, the focus is on the sin, right? That people, everybody is a sinner because the Bible says all have sinned. But what is really communicated here, we've been communicated here, is something happened to the human race as a result of sin. Sin causes us to fall short of the glory of God. If you read it in the New Living Translation, it says, everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glory or standard. All right? The word translated glory there is a Hebrew word doxa, D-O-X-A, which simply uh, really means splendor, brightness, majesty, I mean, all these good things that I'm sure most of you know. But there's a, there's, a, there's a meaning of it that is very relevant here. He's talking about a most glorious condition or the most exalted state. So that is sin causes man 
to fall short of his most glorious condition. All right? I mean, I'm sure you've taken pictures before. When you take pictures, you see some of them, you just think they capture you better than the other one, right? All right? You just have this, this you know, maybe you smile. Everything was perfect. You know, you, the smile, the angle, you know, this day, the way you tilt yourself, the way you smile, the reflection of light on your face, the way your shirt or whatever just... You know, or maybe the cameraman is just so anointed that they capture you. Yeah, you say, oh, yeah, what have you, you know, what have you been doing all this while? This is, this reflect me in my best state, right? So there is the best state of man, right? The, the most exalted state, the most glorious state that God wants us to be operate from, sin caused us to fall short of that. And that's the dangerous thing. You know, sometimes we casualize it. We just know oh, sin is this, sin, you know, uh, yeah, we don't know. But sin is so dangerous that it affects our, our life, what we become in life. See, when we live in sin, you know, this is talking about original sin, but that's also equal to when we continue in sin, right? That sin will limit you, right, from becoming the best that God wants you to be. Praise the name of Jesus. So when we talk about the glory, we're really talking about the best, uh, the glory of God. You know, nobody can really see the glory of God. We're really talking about the glory of God as it's reflected through us. Hallelujah. So it's the glory of God that the Lord permits. All of us, there is a glorious standard. There's an ideal. There's God's plan for you. That if you really walk with him, you will attain that. So you will be all he wants you to be. You will, you will, you know, the picture will be, wow, you really became what God really created you to be. Praise the name of Jesus. Now, and if you really look at it, that is one of the things Jesus was supposed to portray to us. All right? In fact, in Hebrews chapter 1, the Bible talks about uh, the sun being the radiance of God's glory. If you start from chapter one, I mean verse, verse one, it says God has spoken to us in the past through prophets, you know, through uh, all this. But it says now in verse two, he's speaking to us through his son, right? Who he has appointed to be here of all things. And he said in verse three, the sun is the radiance of God's glory, right? and the exact representation of his being. So if God were to walk on earth, that is how he would look like. All right? It wouldn't look like anything weird. It would look like Jesus. Sustaining all things by his powerful words, after, after he had provided purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on heaven. So he's talking about Jesus being God's glorious ideal. God's representation on earth. And that is God's plan for us. In fact, salvation comes, Jesus came so we can be restored back. At least the potential for that can be restored back. Hallelujah. And that's why if you go from Romans 3 to go to Romans 8, in verse 29 and 30, it talks about who those for those God for new. In fact, I would like I would like all of us to read it together if you can look at the screen. Can we can we read it together? Let's read it together. For those God for new, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also. I mean, this is a very, this is a, I mean, this, this can be like three days message talking about this verse. It's so deep. He has vast implication. We can talk about this. But he talked about, about five things there. He talked about foreknowledge of God. I mean, that's some, that can get some people going, some theologians going for days, oftentimes arguing, actually. So, but we're not going to talk about that. He's saying, then he talks about predestination. He said, the people God for new, he predestined. 
And those who predestined, he called. Those who called, he justified. Talking about justification. And he ends in glorification, right? That ultimately, God's goal is for us to attain to that glorious ideal. Did you get that now? So the, the journey of our salvation is God knew us, God predestined us, God called us, God justified us, and at some point that ends in us becoming the exact representation of his glory, what he wants us to be. So we actually look like what he wants us to be. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. So that is very important to understand the concept of glory. When we're talking about, you know, Falling short of God's glory is falling short of God's glorious ideal for me. The way I'm supposed to live, many of us, you know, it's a sin will cause us to fall short of it. Now, so what Jesus did was to remove that, all right? Remove sin and the consequence of it, all right? True by offering of his body for you, by offering himself on the cross of Calvary, by dying for our sin, so the consequence of sin was dealt with on the cross of Calvary. And that's why salvation is not any other place except in Christ. That's the only person that paid the price. Salvation is not about just trying to be good. And many of us, I think we just say, oh yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to be good. That's not what saves you, all right? Salvation is about dealing with the roots, all right, which is sin. So that was dealt with. And that's why Jesus gives us that. Hallelujah. So glory is really the destination of every believer. Once you become saved, yes, your sins are forgiven, uh, you are going to go to heaven, but glory, as long as you live here on earth, that glorious ideal must become your pursuit. It is your destination. It is where you are going to get into if you keep walking with him. Hallelujah. Now, there's another verse that I want to just, okay, I still have a little time. I want to read, which is 2 Corinthians 3.18. These are verses that we talked about, but at least I will link this so we, we get a better understanding. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says, so all of us who have had this veil removed. So he talked about a veil in the um, in the, in, that, that prevent us from really, from the light of the gospel. So the way the glory comes to us is through Jesus, who is called the light, all right? So the gospel is really talking about, is Jesus. The good news is Jesus. So he's saying that if you look at the, bar, if you go to the background of this, he was talking about how the devil prevents the light from really shining into the heart of those who don't believe and he was talking about there's a veil that the enemy puts, all right? The veil that the enemy puts, that even when people become believers, there's still that veil there. That even when they are reading the scripture, the real essence of scripture, which is really the light, which is really Jesus, is missed. And a lot of people still read the Bible today, by the way. I mean, like that. So he's saying that, so all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of God. Did you get that now? And I want you to notice the word see and reflect. Those are two different things, right? You see it, then you reflect it. It means like Islam is that the light shines on you and somehow you reflect it outside. That's, how, that's actually how we see colors, right? It's true reflection. He said we see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, is the Spirit now that he's talking about, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. So you see what I'm talking about? That Jesus is this ideal, right, that we just must be like. You know, it becomes, it becomes like just the ideal of it, that we, we just, so that's the person. And as, as, as long as we focus on him, and he said the way we become like him is for God, for his light to shine on us. So the light shines on us, and we reflect him. So people see Jesus through me, because I, I don't necessarily need to focus. So sometimes we are so focused on being right. And I think that's sometimes our main problem. We are focused on being right, showing Jesus, 
you know, to the world. No, no, no. We're supposed to focus on having the light shine on us. Because really, you, are, you don't have a light. You reflect a light. All right? When he says you are the light of the world, he's not necessarily saying you are that. All right? Jesus is re- the real light. The reason why you become light is because you allow him to shine through you. Hallelujah. It's almost like the, way we, it's almost like the, the science of the moon, right? The moon has no light of itself. The moon reflects the light of the sun. Hallelujah. That's exactly us. So he's saying that the veil is removed by the Holy Spirit, and we see, all right, the glory of the Lord. And the Lord now, which is the Holy Spirit, as, as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, right, in studying the Word, in getting revelation from the Word, right, what happened to us is He makes us more. I want you to notice that He said, the Spirit makes us. And oftentimes we try to make ourselves. You know, we try so hard to make ourselves. No, He makes us more and more like Him as we are changed. How many of us want to, I want to, want to say change? He said, we are changed into his glorious image. Praise the name of Jesus. So the concept of glory and light is powerful. It is really fundamental to our existence as believers. So when Isaiah say, we go back to our Isaiah 60 now. Isaiah now brings another perspective to it, which I really want to talk about today. To say, even after we have become believers, it's not that many of us necessarily attain to that glory. And he's, he indicates here that one of the reasons is we don't arise. So he says, arise and shine. All right? He said, the light is come, right? And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. But to really shine, to really reflect, that's what he's trying to say now, right? To shine is to reflect. You must arise. Hallelujah. You must arise. So he's saying, arise and shine. So many of us even know all these things I'm talking about has happened. We're not going to cause Jesus to die for us, right? He already did. We're not going to cause Jesus to remove the consequence of sin. He already did. Many of us we only walk around with the potential to shine. And you see, potential that never becomes a reality is just potential. So what's the point of potential? What's the point of somebody having potential and never really realizing? And that's, that's the sad story of many believers. Potential is there. The potential to really do great things, to be great, to be what God has called. No matter where that, it doesn't have to be in church, it could be in career, it could be ministry, it could be in starting organization, it could be in writing books, it could, it could be in anything that God has called you to be. What God wants all of us to be as believers is to reflect his glory and to be the best we were made to be. Hallelujah. So he said, to be able to be that, there need to be a rise. Now, let's go back to the word arise. The word arise is also a Hebrew word. You all know that the Bible was written in Hebrew, right? At least the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. It's the word kum. It's spelled Q-U-W-M. But it simply means to arise and come on the scene. I want to give you that perspective now. He said to Arise and come on the scene. All right? It also means to confirm, to ratify, to establish, to impose. When I was reading this, the only thing that comes to my mind was when the Bible talks about God's promises are yea and amen. And that there's a version that says, God says yes to his promise, right? All we need to do is say amen. All right? We, we, we really have to confirm God's promise. So God, when he made his promises, he says yes at the end of every one of them, right? And we need to respond and say amen uh, by our life, by everything we have. And that's faith. Faith is actually agreeing with God. So he's saying to confirm, to ratify, 
to establish, to impose. He also says to be clearer, to confirm and continue. And you can get all this anyway. It's, I'm not that brilliant. You can go to, this is not like, wow, where is that coming from? You really do a little digging. Uh, strong concordance will really get you this. And it's available online, by the way, for free. Amen. Some of us bought it before it became free. But that's a, that's a different story. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But it also means to stand, endure. Endure. All right? So many of us, we are really crippled. And that is why we don't experience God's glory. We don't reflect God's glory because we really don't come into sin. We don't come on the scene. So it's almost like there's a stage set for you, all right? And, and light is really, if you have gone to any of those Broadway show, any of those great show, most of these are really accomplished by light, right? The person wears some costume, but the light is really what makes it happen, right? So the light is beaming, but the person that is supposed to be reflected refuses to come on the stage. All right, just would not show up. And many of us, the reason why we don't become what God wants us to be, simply we don't show up. We don't show up. We are missing in action. We don't come on the scene. We don't confirm that I'm there. We don't necessarily stay with it. I mean, we, you know, we wobble. We're like, I think James 1.23 talks about, you know, anyone that that uh, reads the word and does not obey, is like that person that, go, that, that looks at his face in a mirror, right? And forget what he looks like. I mean, if you really think about that scripture, I mean, when you really look into the Bible, he's talking about the Bible, you know that, right? The Bible, and the Bible is actually the mirror. The only thing, that, the difference between the Bible and the real mirror is in the mirror, in the real mirror, you see yourself the way you are, right? But in the Bible, you see yourself the way God sees you. That's a big difference, right? So he said anyone that really reads the word and does not do it is like a person that just look, go and sees himself and walks away and say, oh, yeah, what did I look like again? Forget. I'm sure that person will probably need some treatment, right? You would think you need treatment. If that's, if that's your problem, then you need some treatment. And I think many of us need some spiritual treatment. Because when you really look at the scripture, you see who you are. You see how God sees you. You see yourself righteous, right? You see yourself victorious. You see what God calls you. You see yourself the way God sees you. But the problem is most times we go and we forget it. So our life is completely so different. Our reality is completely different from how God sees us. And there's that gap. Hallelujah. So we, we must confirm what you see. That's what James is trying to say. To be, to be able to, you, obedience is not always, oh, just do's and don'ts. No, it's just agreeing and continue to agree, to agree rather, all right? He said he sees himself and he forgets. And he walks away and he just panics. He, he, you know, he's just scrambling, just like every other person. There's really no difference. You know, to arise is to confirm, to ratify, to establish. In fact, sometimes to impose. Because there are forces out there that really resist it. Most times the forces are really in our minds, right? That tells us, you are really not what you see. You are not. You are, you are not the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And you know you are not. And you say, yeah, you are right. I'm not. And that's it. And a lot of times that's what. There are forces that say you are not that prophecy that he gave to you. That you're, you're going to go around the world and do what? You know, you're going to write a book and everybody's going to read it. Wow. You must think you are made of some different... Uh, and you're like, you know what, that's true. What, what was I even thinking? And you just, you just go. You know, so a lot of times we talk ourselves out of it. 
All right? And I believe one of what the devil is busy doing the most is to get or is to confirm his own agenda. You know how you see things and it's confirmed? And even though they are lies. You know, you see someone, somebody tells you about someone that they are this. And all of a sudden, the next time you see them, they are doing something, you're like, oh, yes. That's how the devil, he sets us up to really begin to believe something totally different about ourselves. Sometimes he tells us, look, you are an exception, you know, to what God is saying. So it's important to understand that when the Bible is saying arise, it's a very loaded word. Hallelujah. So the, the, my summary here is people who really fulfill their glorious ideal, attain that glorious ideal, are the people who find the strength and the courage to rise up. And that's why I titled the message today, The Faith to Arise. Because I really believe that, you see, that faith to arise is the most important kind of faith. It's the most important, it's the most dynamic, it's the most powerful kind of faith. And that faith is really, we're going to pray, hopefully we have a few minutes to really pray. And you can go, it's, the, it's a supernatural faith. Because the faith, even in the physical, the, 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 the strength to rise up is actually greater than the, re, the strength to continue walking. You know that, right? You know that if you, your car really uses more fuel in that startup, that startup, that first mile, the first few miles, that's when your car really, that's why when you stop and go, when you stop and go, you use more gas. Many of us are just getting that now, right? You're like, oh, yeah, oh, I, I've been wondering all these years. <laughs> I just help you now, right? Because starting is, requires more fuel, more energy. It's the same thing with a plane lifting. So for a plane to lift, there are all kinds of forces, the thrust, the lift, the weight, all right? And, you know, the, 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 the plane has to overcome the, the gra gravity. We call it the force of gravity. That pushes everything down. And that's why the plane has to move about 150 miles an hour, right, to 180, depending on the size, to be able to lift. But you see, once a plane lifts and it gets to a certain altitude, it cruises. At cruising speed, it's still using force, but it's not as much. And that's why I believe that a lot of times, many of us really miss God at that point of arising. Because the faith to really rise whether from sin, whether from disappointment, whether from whatever, you know, whatever is holding us down, you know, is not always there. All right, so we are somehow crippled. Fear, defeat, disappointment. And I believe that what is, lift, you know, what is, what is really limiting so many people is this faith to arise. So many Christians, of course. Praise the name of Jesus. So... What is standing between you and your best, the best you, is really the first few steps. The first few steps. Most businesses fail within two years or zero to whatever years of their existence. If they're able to overcome that, the chances of lasting is very, very long is there. Most marriages fail the first couple of years. If you're able to weather that, your, your, gonna, your chances of lasting very long is, very, is there. There is always, we call it inertia in physics, right? That's the force to really change the state of a thing from a rest to moving. So that initial force is really what is missing in so many of us. So we are there. I believe there are so many people here who could be doing great things for God called, anointed, gifted, but just sitting there, refusing to walk on the stage, all right, talking themselves out of it. And that's why the glory, you know, the glory of God, that is, it's like God is waiting. And so he said, he said, your light has come. It's not that the light is going to come, right? The light is here. And I think that's, I'm speaking to so many people here. Yeah, your light is come. 
the glory of the Lord is risen. All right? On you. It's focused on you. It's focused on, on the stage. And you're there backstage saying, oh, I can't do this. And you're just chicken out. You say, oh, no, no, no. This is, this is not me. I'm, 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 oh, no, 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 no. I can't do this. And you just go. And that's why you are not what God wants you to be. So that first few steps, we're going to ask God to give us the faith to arise and come on the scene. The faith to arise and confirm God's promises. The faith to arise and be clear. Right? The faith to arise and stand and endure. Praise the name of Jesus. I believe God is calling you to that in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to try to wrap up by talking, by, by just giving you a few points. Some of the places where this was used in the Bible, the word arise, and that might apply to a few people here. Some of us need to arise from our sinful state. All right? Sinful state. Some of us, you need to arise from your sinful state. See, sin will limit you. I mean, forget about what you read on the internet, what people say, what anyone says, what is popular out there. You know, we are now in 2018, we're in the 21st century. You know, look, just know, sin will limit you. It will limit what God has called you to be. It will limit you from becoming the best you. Now, if you're satisfied with the less of you, fine. All right? You can just say, you know what? That's fine. End of conversation. But if, you're not, if you want the best of you, and I'm sure that is every one of us. That's why you work hard. That's why you are, you know, some of us are immigrants. That's why you travel thousands of miles to start all over. That's why you are doing your best, walking, going to school, you know, doing the best you can do. So I know you are motivated to be the best of you, but sin will limit you, all right? That's why you must arise. Now, this statement was uttered by the prodigal, by the prodigal son, the popular prodigal son in Luke. He said, I will arise and go to my father. All right. I will arise. Luke 15, 18. He said, I will arise and go to my father. Many of us simply, some of us here, you need to arise and go back to God. Maybe you are even a believer before, then you, you are now on your own. You're backsliding. You are now in sin. You are now going to a club. You are now trying to enjoy life a little bit. You know, and you feel, you know, I'm gone. Some of you, maybe you have even gone. You have gone so far, you are like, I think I've burnt the bridges. No, you have not. The Lord is calling you to arise. Hallelujah. You might think that is difficult, but God is giving you that faith to arise. All right? The faith to arise just like the prodigal. See, the prodigal song, one thing about him, that was not his first option. He's all, he, he had, the first option was to try to cope, Right? You know, after he saw that, you know what, I think this is over. He started to anger with some guys. He started to try to figure out what to do. He started to really, you know, you know, just find other ways of coping. You know, he tried, he tried, he tried. And I think at some point he just said, you know what, I'm going to arise. I'm going to really, you know, there is something for me in my father's house. It is probably still there. Even if I don't get that, maybe I, I will get something. And he said I will arise. Some people here need to arise. Arise out of your sin. Abandon the life of sin. Abandon some sinful friends, some influences. Abandon those things because it is going to limit you. But when you arise and go back to God, you are going to shine. In Jesus' name. Some of us need to arise from our Failure or falling state. All right? Micah chapter 7 verse 8 says, Do not rejoice over me, my enemy, for when I fall, I will arise. That's the word arise. I will go back to the stage. 
Am I, maybe I've gone there before, I missed the script. I will go back there. You know, one thing about failure in life is it, it tried to make us a failure. Failure is not you. Failure is that thing you did. Yeah? You fail in something does not make you a failure. Hallelujah. You know, but the devil tried to equate that. All right? No, you fail in this, oh, you are, you are a failure. Right? Oh, you fail in this, you are a failure. You know, there are stories of people who have failed in things. In fact, most successful people have had their share of failures. They succeeded because they rose up. All right? They decided not to be defined by their failure. So you need to, whether it's personal failure, whether it's professional failure, whether it's spiritual failure, you know, whether it's marital failure. Some people are, you know, maybe you've had marital problem, you've gone through divorce. I mean, there's so many things that has gone on in your life and you feel like, I think I'm a failure. I'm unusable. I can't be anything anymore. That is really the lie of the enemy. It's the lie of the enemy to keep you crippled, crouched, down, so you will not never rise up. But God is beaming the light. And he's saying if you will step up, you're still going to shine. And I'm speaking to someone today in Jesus' name. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of us need to rise from our state of disappointment. We have been so disappointed in life, disappointed by people, disappointed by God. And what is keeping us from shining is your staying disappointed. You know, Abraham was one of those. He was, at some point, what I term as disappointed. All right? He, him and a lot, he took a lot with him. And they were, you know, they, they, at a point, they, things became so great and they, but they were having problems. They were having crisis. They were having conflict. And he said, you know, he tried to play, play a big man, a mature man. He said, Lord, just pick whatever you want to pick. You know, they, they needed to divide themselves. And the Bible said, Lord, took the best part and he, just, and he just left. So I think he must have been disappointed. Because at some point, the Lord actually told him, lift up your eyes. Now, and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give to you, and your descendant forever. And I will make your descendant as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendant also could be numbered. And verse 17 says, arise. You know, sometimes we need to arise. If I all the time, we need to arise from disappointment. Disappointment will keep you crippled. You know, obviously disappointment will lead to anger, bitterness, right? We're angry. Some of us are angry at God, angry at people, angry at your parents, angry at your friends, angry at your church, angry at everybody around you who have betrayed you, who have not done what they are supposed to do, and you miss God. Because that anger keeps you, keeps you crippled, keeps you crouched. And you're not able to be your best you. Hallelujah. The Lord is saying you need to arise from your disappointment. You need to, you need to arise. Stop being disappointed. Some of us have been maybe disappointed in relationships. And you're like, I'm doing this no more. You know what? You have just succumbed. You have just crouched. The Lord is saying you need to arise today. This is your moment to arise. Because you are still going to shine. In Jesus' name. Praise the name of Jesus. Some of us have challenges ahead of us that are just overwhelming. You know, sometimes when you have a, a lot to do in a day, that's when it's, it's so hard to rise up in the morning, right? You just feel like, you know what, this is just... And sometimes what keeps us from achieving anything is the size of what we need to achieve. All right? when we see the sheer size of it, of the assignment, of the task, all right? If somebody just takes you into a room, they say, we need to sort up this paper, and the pile is from here to here, you're going to say, you know what, I don't even know where to begin. Maybe I should quit today, right? That's generally how it is. But if you can somehow divide it into tasks, all right? 
you know, just do a little task. You'll see that very soon you'll be able to overcome them. But the sheer size of it can cripple a lot of us. So some of us here need to arise from that. All right? And Joshua, was, Joshua found himself in that situation. In Joshua, you know, Joshua, actually uh, the last chapter of Deuteronomy to Joshua 1, found himself in, this, in a place where Moses had died. Now, he was supposed to take over from Moses, but people refused to move on from Moses. You know that, right? I mean, how can you really move from Moses? You, you, it means you really don't know Moses. If you really know Moses, you don't move on from Moses, right? People like Moses are hard to find. Parted the Red Sea, you know, prayed and, you know, manna came from heaven. I mean, all kinds of things about Moses. At some point, people believed that Moses was not human, right? Moses was God. Now, Moses died. And people say, look, we're not moving on from here. Now, you are supposed to take the stage and take the mic. And people are like, who are you? And people will say, no. And God had to tell him, look, Moses is dead. If you go to Joshua chapter 1, verse 2, the Lord said to him, Moses, my servant, is dead. You see, the Lord did not need to tell him Moses is dead. <laughs> There's a reason why the Lord is telling him that Moses is not coming back. So maybe in his mind he's saying, I think, God, can you wake up Moses? All right? So Moses is dead. Moses is not coming back, right? And he says... Now, therefore, what? Arise. Some of us, your Moses is dead. You need to arise. All right? Daddy is gone. That used to bail you out, right? It's no longer there. But don't be overwhelmed. Arise. Because the light. You see, the great, the great thing about this is the reason why we arise, and I believe that that is really the key to faith to arise is knowing what the Lord has accomplished. Because he's saying your light has come. You see, the greatest job is really light. Who can manufacture light? Right? You see, David just needed to arise and step to the place. Goliath was already defeated. Right? Goliath was a defeated person. I mean, Goliath was fighting against God. And that's why David said, who is this that is defined, what? The God of Israel. So he figured out, look, this guy is fighting against God. God, God ain't going to lose the battle. I mean, it's, it's never going to happen. I mean, it's not, it's not even about me now. It's about God. You're, you're, you're fighting against God. You're going to lose the battle. So he figured it out that, look, this guy is a loser. I just need to step. So the stage was set for David, and David stepped into it. Hallelujah. That's why many of, that's one, many of us, God has won the battle. The glory is already restored. Jesus already did what he takes. The light has come. Jesus has come. And the glory of the Lord is risen on you. Hallelujah. The provision for you to become what God wants you to become is being made. God has set the table. All you need to do is to rise up. Rise up from your disappointment. Rise up from your sin. Rise up from your fear. Rise up and stay raised up. Praise the name of Jesus. If you rise up long enough, you are going to begin to shine. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So God is calling us to arise because the battle is won. The victory is yours. I would like us to rise up and just pray and ask God to give us. I mean, I believe many of us can look at some areas of our life, even as I was preparing this, there are some areas of my life I really need to rise up. I'm not stepping up the plate. I'm, I'm wobbling. I, I don't have faith. I don't have the courage to just step out. You know, maybe I'm looking at the money. I'm looking at the implication. I'm looking at what, you know, the potential. I'm looking at the... So the potential for embarrassment, you know, if it doesn't work, maybe I'm looking at all those things, but God is saying, just focus on me and arise. Let's lift up our hands and say, God, give me the grace to arise. In those areas of my life where I need to rise up, 
Give me the grace. Give me the courage. I want to attain my glorious ideal. I want to be the best I was made to be. Sin has been destroyed. You are no longer under the power of sin if you are a genuine believer here. But you still cannot afford to go without becoming the best you. Lord, help me to be my best me. Give me the faith to arise. Maybe you are best in certain area, but not best in certain area. Just ask God to give you the faith to arise, the courage to arise in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I'm asking, Lord, you will release faith here, release courage here, release supernatural ability here, release supernatural strength here for your people to arise. Arise from defeat, arise from disappointment, arise, 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 because your light has come and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. While our eyes are closed before I pray, I'd like to pray for anyone here. You're in sin, and you really know that you're not walking with God. You're not walking right. You're living in deception, and you want me to pray for you. I'd like you to raise your right hand. Well, please, all eyes closed, just so that we can respect. Any other person? God bless you. Any, any other person? Please raise it where so I can see it. I need to see it. Thank you. God bless you. One, two, three, four, five, six. God bless you. Seven. I want you to place that hands on your chest. And I want you to say after me. Jesus, I thank you because you died for me. I thank you because you consider me worthy enough to pay the price of my sin. And today, I confess you as my Savior. I confess you as my Lord. I invite you into my life. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Wash me. Today I declare, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your power. Help me to walk with you. Thank you because you have answered my prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. If you pray that prayer, I want you to take another step and make sure you, the tear up portion, you have the bulletin, the bulletin has a tear up, make sure you fill it out and just drop it in the offering basket. I would like to pray with you. I would like to contact you uh, if need be and just so that your, you know, your journey of your faith can be smoother. I want us to lift up our hands. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for speaking to us from above. Thank you for speaking to us by your spirit. Lord, I pray your word will not return to you void. Holy Spirit, you are our personal reminder. When we uh, tend to forget how we look like, you are there to remind us how you see us. When we forget to arise, you are there to encourage us to arise. I commit and I commend everyone to your hand today. The Lord, you will release on them the power, the grace. And Lord, you will give us the, 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 the grace to really cultivate that, that relationship with you. So that those times we need you, you will be there. In the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the glorious future that awaits everyone here. Thank you because you have answered our prayer. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen.